Okay, it looks like everything is good to go. Welcome to Friday Night Live. I'm Debbie Hatch, the owner and CEO of Pinnacle Personnel Services. Come on here every Friday or try to every Friday um, and just do a little bit of a 15 or 20 minute um, Q&A and answer questions that people have about their retirement and their benefits. So tonight's topic is one that does come up quite frequently when I'm teaching classes and that is what does that block on my leave and earning statement that says something like cumulative FERS or cumulative CSRS or cumulative retirement, depending on the agency that I work for, they may word it just a little bit differently, but it always has that word cumulative total and there's a dollar amount there. What the heck is that? And what happens to that cumulative total when I leave my job? So just so happens, comes up all the time, like I said, uh, but this week I got two emails from people asking about that question and I actually did a personal consult and that employee had the same question. So I said, okay, this is obviously something that we need to talk about on the Friday Night Live. You can see the question that was submitted came from a Department of Defense civilian. So it specifically mentions block 19. Everybody's leave and earning statement, or you can call that a pay stub if you want to, is just a little bit different. So for our Department of Defense civilians, yes, it's block 19 that is gonna say cumulative total. So I've got an example of that right here. But again, it's block 19 if you're working for Department of Defense. I couldn't bring up the pay stub for every federal agency. We would be here for a while going through it with every single agency. So I have an example here for Department of Defense. I have an example for Department of the Interior. And I also have an example for Customs and Border Protection. But regardless of the block number, okay, we're not gonna be talking about that because that is different. Regardless of the block number, the box always says cumulative retirement. So as a federal employee, when I'm working in a non-temporary job, I am required to pay into retirement and social security. I have the opportunity to pay into TSP. That's completely optional. Even though we do sign employees up for that right now, if they don't want to be in the program, they don't have to stay. They can disenroll from TSP at any time. When it comes to me mandatorily contributing to retirement and to Social Security, the amount for my retirement is set based on whether I'm FERS, which is the new system, or CSRS, which is the old system, and depending on what kind of work I do for the federal government, whether I am what I'll call a traditional employee or a special provision employee. So it's easiest to say what special provisions is. That is a federal law enforcement officer, firefighter, air traffic controller, customs and border protection officer who is covered under law enforcement. If you're not one of those special categories of employees, then you are what I call traditional, okay? Special provision employees pay one amount, traditional employees pay a different amount. CSRS people pay one amount, FERS people pay a different amount. And it's not even that clear because under FERS, depending on when I was initially hired as a federal civilian, I might be paying a different amount for my retirement than somebody else who was also working under FERS because we've changed the numbers a couple of times. So in the slide that is showing right now on your screen, you can see next to the Civil Service Retirement and Disability Fund, which is the name of the trust fund where all of the federal employees put their retirement contribution, we pay in, the government pays in, but the money sitting in the box that's called the Civil Service Retirement and Disability Fund. So off to the side of that box, I show you that CSRS employees pay 7% of each biweekly paycheck into the trust fund. CSRS offset employees and FERS employees that were hired into the government before January 1st of 2013 are contributing 0.8% of their own money every two weeks into that trust fund. 
FERS employees who came on board during calendar year 2013 in a time between January 1st and December 31st contribute 3.1% of their own money into that retirement account. And FERS employees who came on board after December 31st of 2013 contribute 4.4% of their own money into the trust fund. Now, the numbers that I just quoted to you are for traditional employees. If your special provisions, in addition to the rates that I just quoted, you're required to pay another 0.5% every two weeks into that retirement trust fund. Now, because I mentioned it, I'll talk about it, but we're not gonna get deep into that social security box tonight, right? That's mandatory as well. What we pay into Social Security is a tax that is called OASDI. It equals 6.2% of each of our paychecks up to a certain amount of earnings, which does change every year. Again, I'm not going to get deep into that. We've talked about it before. We can talk about it again if we want to, but we're not going to do it tonight. I'm not going to talk about the TSP tonight either, but you can contribute up to the maximum amounts. We have one limit if you are under 50 and a different limit if you're 50 or older. We'll talk about it later on. So I have to contribute into this retirement account depending on whether I'm CSRS, FERS, FERS before 2013 in that year or after that year, knowing that special provisions always have to pay that extra 0.5. Now, the money that I am personally contributing into that retirement trust fund comes out of my paycheck after it's already been taxed. Okay, after it's already been taxed. So it goes into the trust fund and it sits there. That cumulative total that you see on your leave and earning statement may or may not be the total amount that you've contributed over your entire career. Occasionally, that box might reset to zero. Okay, what it's actually tracking is not how much you've contributed over your entire career, but how much you've contributed under the current payroll system. So when I was a federal employee, my box went to zero twice. It happened the first time when I was working for the Air Force and the Air Force decided to move away from the local payroll office and go to DFAS. That's a different payroll office. DFAS is starting the job from today going forward. They didn't have me when I was under the old payroll office. So when we transitioned, then my first leave and earning statement under DFAS said I had zero money in that retirement box. Uh, that concerned a lot of people and a lot of employees will ask me, well, where did that money go? No, it's still there. It's still sitting there in that trust fund, but you don't see it anymore because now the new payroll office is only reporting what you've contributed while you've been under them. Okay, so that's the first time it happened. I didn't do anything. My agency just decided to change payroll. The second time it happened to me was because I did something. I left the Air Force and I went to work at the Department of Veterans Affairs. I had a different payroll office. So when I left the Air Force, I got to the VA. My first leave and earning statement said that I had zero dollars in that cumulative retirement total. The fact is that my money from the old payroll office was still sitting there. The money from the Air Force was still sitting there. And then when I left the VA, the VA closed out my records and sent the missing number to OPM. And now OPM says, okay, this is in fact the true total that you have in there from all of these various pieces. But it wasn't showing on my leave and earning statement anymore. I didn't see it anymore. Let me know if that makes sense, okay? Now, I do like um, some of the agencies, and I had one here in my example, which I believe was the interior. Instead of just saying cumulative retirement, it says cumulative retirement under this appointment. That seems to make it a little bit more clear for the employee. That's my opinion. You don't have to agree, but I like the way that they put it on there. 
Okay, so my money's contributed is sitting out there in that trust fund. That trust fund is managed by the Office of Personnel Management. I go through my federal career. At some point, I become eligible for retirement and I go ahead and retire. My annuity payment, and we can call that my retirement check, right? It's not technically correct, but you know one of the things that I love about teaching people is talking in plain, easy to understand terms, not all of the complication and the technical terminology that the regulation uses. You can do that if you want to. I prefer not to. So when I retire, then I'm gonna get this annuity payment or my retirement check, which is computed by multiplying my creditable length of service times my high three average salary times a formula. Formula changes, depends on whether I'm CSRS or FERS, depends on whether I'm special provisions or not, depends on whether I retire on a disability or not, but for every person, every time, we compute that annuity payment multiplying creditable service times the high three times sum formula, okay? So this is my payment, this is my monthly retirement check. That monthly annuity is going to be comprised of a little bit of the money that I put in the trust fund, and the rest of it is coming from the Office of Personnel Management. Now remember that that money that I put into the trust fund has already been taxed. It was taxed when I put it in there. So they can't tax it again when I get it out. That little bit, you can think of that as a refund, okay? Again, terminology not exactly correct, but it gets my point across. I put this money in this box for my retirement and now I've retired. So every single month, I'm getting a little bit of my money back, a little bit of my money back. It's not going to be taxed again because it's already been taxed. But the rest of my annuity payment is coming from the Office of Personnel Management. Because when I retire, I don't just get back what I put in the box. I get a retirement for the rest of my life. So my little bit, not taxed again. The rest of it coming from OPM has never been taxed before. That's what I'm going to be paying taxes on in retirement. So really, that cumulative total doesn't drive what I get for my annuity. It drives my taxes. So we can talk about taxes very simplistically, and then we can talk about them from the complicated reality of the way it's done. When it comes to the federal tax, Simplistically, you want to change your tax withholding? You fill out a new W-4P, which stands for pension. Just like the W-4 when you came to work and you said, I'm married, I'm single, I have this many exemptions. And based on what you put on that piece of paper, you get your paycheck every two weeks. The IRS gets a little bit of money that is earmarked with your name on it. The W-4P is the same thing as the W-4. You just tell the Office of Personnel Management who tells the Internal Revenue Service whether you're having taxes withheld, married, or single, and how many exemptions you have. You wanna change those taxes at any time after you retire? You can do that by going to OPM's online services. They make it super simple for you. Now, right now while you're working, okay, you fill out the W-4 and that's how your taxes are withheld. Then at the end of the year, you get a W-2. And it says, hey, we sent you this much money last year, but we also sent the IRS this much money for you last year. File your taxes. Pay what you owe or get a refund if you paid too much in. Same thing in retirement, except that you won't get a W-2 anymore. That's for work earnings. You'll get a 1099-R which is for retirement earnings. It's a different form number. It's the same thing it's always been. OPM is gonna say, hey, we sent you this much money, but some of that money was your refund. Since it's already been taxed, you're only gonna report this amount of money on your income tax form. We already sent the IRS this amount. Pay what you owe or get a refund. Like I said, simplistically, that's how we do it, okay? Much more complicated, what we're going to have to do is look at that cumulative total, how much have you paid in over your entire career, and 
Who's entitled to money from the Office of Personnel Management when you retire? Because on the first page of your application, you get to choose whether you are going to leave a survivor benefit or not. Survivor benefits are kind of like life insurance. You pay money while you're living so that when you die, your spouse is able to continue to get money. Complicated topic, again, we've covered it before, we can cover it again. I'm not gonna get deep into that tonight. Just know that if you're married, you can choose to leave a survivor benefit. In which case, you get money while you're living. If you die before your spouse does, your spouse continues to get money even after you pass away. Now, maybe you're not married, maybe you are, but you have decided that you're not gonna leave a survivor benefit. So when you retire, OPM looks at, did you leave a survivor benefit, yes or no? How old were you at the time of retirement? And how much money do you have in that cumulative fund? Okay, so if you look at the top of this slide, that's for the person who didn't leave a survivor benefit. So it's only based on you. So let's say that I retire at my minimum retirement age, which is 56. They look at my cumulative total. They look at the top of this chart and it says age 56 to 60, divide by 310. So they take my total, they divide by 310, and that's going to tell them the quote tax-free. That's what they call it. I don't like to call it that because it's already been taxed, but that's what they call the tax-free portion. If I did leave a survivor benefit, now though, not only am I eligible for money, but if I die, my husband's eligible to continue to get money too. So they add our ages together and they use the bottom of this slide to get our combined actuary factor, take that cumulative total, divide by that combined actuary factor in order to get the quote, again, tax-free portion. You don't have to figure this out. The Office of Personnel Management is gonna do it for you as soon as you retire. What I want you to know is that you get a pension for the rest of your life. It's not just what that cumulative total is. That just tells us how much you paid in towards your retirement. It doesn't tell us what the government paid in for your retirement, it doesn't tell us what you're gonna get in retirement because that's gonna be for the rest of your life, but it's going to tell us what you're, you've already been taxed on. That's what that cumulative total is giving us. Now, that is your money. So if you die prior to retirement, there are people who are potentially eligible for monthly benefits. If you're not married, if you don't have dependent children, that cumulative total can be designated to anyone of your choosing, and they would receive that when you pass away. If it's a monthly benefit, then that cumulative total is not gonna be paid out. Rather, the person is going to get a monthly total. Again, that's a whole nother thing that we can talk about on a different day. That cumulative total is yours. It's paying to somebody if you pass away or it's funding part of your retirement for the rest of your life. Now, in addition to the federal taxes, because those are the ones that we use um, this quote, tax-free portion, we look at your age and everything else. In addition to the federal, depending on where you are after you retire, you might also have to pay state income taxes. There are some states, those at the very top of this slide, that do not have state income tax. So if you move to one of those states after retirement, uh, you wouldn't pay state income tax. They don't have it now. They could change that at any time. The bottom of this slide is showing states that do normally have a state income tax, but don't tax your federal retirement benefits. So they would allow you essentially to write off 100% of your federal retirement from the state's income tax provisions. And then the next slide gives you a variety of states that while they don't allow you to deduct 100%, will allow you to deduct a little bit. And every state is different in its definition of a little bit. Sometimes it's an age requirement. Sometimes you had to have a certain amount of time locked in by a certain date, whatever. You can look at this and see what some of the states are doing. Do know that the federal government automatically withholds the federal income tax. They do not automatically withhold for your state.
Now you do have the option of asking them to do that and it's another thing that you can handle through Office of Personnel Management's online services after you retire, but they're not automatically withholding for your state. I don't want that to come as a surprise to you after you retire. Okay, so my intent was to at least let you know what that cumulative total is all about uh, and the fact that it ties back to your taxes. It doesn't tie back to the amount of the pension that you're getting. Um, nothing happens to that when you retire except that you now re start receiving a little bit out of it, that box every month that you're drawing a retirement check. Don't hesitate to type in any comments that you have about this topic. Let me know any questions that you have about this topic. Let me know if it's not clear. Let me know if it is. And if you have any other suggestions for what I can talk about, I would love that too. Okay, so Chris and Terry, I see two questions. Over what period of time do they pull that cumulative amount, certain amount every year or until it's gone? And can you pull the cumulative amount out as a lump sum? You cannot pull the cumulative amount out as a lump sum. Uh, unless you qualify for something that's called an alternative form of annuity, which means that you have a terminal illness, you have a life expectancy that is normally two years or less. It's not anything that you want to qualify for most certainly, but if you do qualify for the alternative form of annuity, yes, then you can pull it out in a lump sum. Otherwise, no, you cannot. How long do they take to uh, disperse this total? Well, I want to go back to this side. Okay, so it depends on how old the person is when they retire, on whether they leave a survivor benefit or not, because if they do leave a survivor benefit, we've got to look at the age of the employee and their spouse together. And it's going to be that cumulative total, Chris and Terry, that cumulative total that we take and then based on my age or the age of myself and my husband added together, they divide that cumulative total by that factor. And that's going to be the percentage that is tax free until it's gone. Until it's gone. Let me know if that answers your question, okay? It's not a set amount. It's not a set number of years or anything like that. And in fact, um, they started doing this, but previously what happened is that federal employees would retire. We'd have this pot of money and we'd get a retirement check that was 100% out of the pot. And we would get that until the pot was dry. And then we'd start getting money from the government and then we'd start paying taxes. The difference now is that we don't get 100% of that. We're just spreading it out over how long it, however long it lasts. Perfect, thanks. You're so welcome. Thanks for joining me and for asking questions. I really appreciate that. Okay. That is the only question that I saw. Like I said, if you watch this afterwards, you're not seeing it live, don't hesitate to reach out and let me know. I try to respond to every question that is put in there. Let me know. I hope that you are looking forward to your weekend, that you have a great rest of your evening. Take care and let me know how I can help you.